Hey everybody, it's Chris from Chris Beat Cancer, and today I am talking with Dr. Christiane Northrup. Dr. Northrup is a MD, a board certified OBGYN, New York Times bestselling author, and a visionary pioneer in women's health. She's a leading proponent of medicine that acknowledges the unity of mind, body, emotions, and spirit. She's internationally known for her empowering approach to women's health and wellness. She teaches women and many men how to thrive at every stage of life and encourages them to create health on all levels by tuning into their inner wisdom. Uh, her latest book is this one, Dodging Energy Vampires, <laughs> An Empath's Guide to Evading Relationships That Drain You and Restoring Your Health and Power. Hey, Dr. Northrup, how are you doing? Hey. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I love that you are bringing this topic to your audience because there's an energy thing that goes on um, between people. Like I know, I know this. I cannot prove it with a prospective double blind, double deaf clinical trial. But I know that if I had stayed in the marriage I was in, I would have had breast cancer. I know it in my bones. I was headed there. And one of my very best friends had several cancer, breast cancer stare, uh, scares with really bad mammograms and thermograms until she finally broke free of the energy vampire who was her husband. So this is a common pattern that we're only now beginning to understand. Yeah, and I, I'm so excited because I know we're going to go all over the place in our conversation today and it's going to be amazing. But relationships and toxic stress are so destructive to the physical body yeah and this is the part of health and healing that i'm talking about all the time i talk about it in my book in my course but i feel like it's it's not talked about enough certainly not by mds except for you and, and maybe now, a few there, select others there's a few there's a few but i'll tell you why it isn't and this is important um, doctors, by and large, praise God, go to medical school because they want to be healers. That's been my experience. That sure. Doctors are really good people. Nurses are angels. It's just, okay. So therefore, to name a person an energy vampire or to suggest that you're the victim of this kind of personality kind of flies in the face of the of the ongoing belief system. Um, you know, God is love. All people are good at heart. He or she is doing the best they can, uh, this kind of thing. So we've been, uh, or in the families that are hiding one of these, making excuses. Um, we don't air our dirty laundry. Uh, we all know for years and years and years, if a woman was being abused by her husband, it was considered their family's issue. I mean, it took years before you could actually call the police and be taken seriously. I was, I just finished, uh, um, Trevor Noah's book, born a crime. And he talked about his mother having called the police three times after she was beaten. And it was an old boys club in South Africa. Not once did they make a police report. And finally he shot her in the back of the head but because they didn't have prior police reports, he went free after three months, even though there was a million witnesses to him shooting her. So that's the kind of where we are. And if you have one of these in your family, it's usually a mother, a father, it could be one of your children, you could be married to one. Um, it, it, we, especially people like you and me, we're kind of the healer types. We want to believe the best in everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really want to acknowledge that all people are not good at heart. Maybe their souls are somehow. And, you know, in their next life or in heaven, it'll all be revealed. But I believe that it is our job, particularly if you have cancer or if you've had a cancer scare, you must begin to seal the leaks or the boat's going to sink. And generally speaking, the leaks are exactly where you don't want to look, your marriage, your mother, 
You, you just don't want to, ma- you, you know it. Uh, and I know as I'm speaking to you, I can almost hear into the heads of the people listening saying, oh God, I know that I need to get out of this marriage, but I just, I just don't know. And then what happens when you get toward this, when you start to see things for how they are, the energy vampire will give you a crumb. It will tell you something you've always wanted to hear. Well, oh honey, I've always loved you. I will never leave you, that kind of thing. I actually knew, I I had this fantasy in my head that if I died of breast cancer, my then husband would be the guy going to the breast cancer support groups and all the women there would be bringing him covered dishes and darning his socks or whatever and he'd be on to the next person within 10 minutes. Um, Mm. Because you think that they love you but they really don't. They're empty inside. I want to describe what I'm talking about here. Yeah, I was about to ask you, describe an energy vampire. I think people are already listening. They already have other people probably popping into their head right now. They're like, I bet this this sounds like such and such, but what are the traits? Okay, first of all, let's just be clear. In medicine and psychiatry, we would label these people personality disorder, okay? And if you do brain scans, and this is incredibly controversial, but if you do brain scans, there's a lot of evidence that the uh, empathy circuits aren't there in their brain. They literally don't have the capacity to think of others. They're out for themselves. They are, so, so the personality disorders as they are listed in the DSM-5, that's the Diagnostic Manual for Psychiatric Disorders, is um, sociopathy, psychopathy, borderline personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, but all of them, almost all of them contain this one thing, narcissism. Yeah. Narcissism. Hmm. And that's being self-centered. Narcissists, you nourish yourself with your faith, with your marriage, with good food. You nourish yourself with that they nourish themselves with what is called narcissistic supply, which is other people's money, attention of any kind, um, sex. They're often very good at it, and they're seductive as as anything. I just read an article today, New York Times article, um, that was about a woman who talked about her seduction addiction, that she specialized in going after men who were in committed relationships, studying them, becoming the exact opposite of their girlfriend so that they would become, she would become such an object of fascination that she'd break up the partnership. And she did it starting at age 16. To me, this was the manual for how you do it. It's, it's almost to me, it's so dark. Wow. It's, it's like, it's, it's evil. Um, and they're very seductive often. They, and here's the thing they have, by the way, this is not in the DSM. <laughs> this is my own experience and research. In any family practice or primary care situation, 25 to 30% of the patients are this. They come in looking for attention. And for, for women... Um, The medical role, the sick role, has been a very uh, socially acceptable way to get attention. You know, so on the worst, and by the way, this is a spectrum. So you have someone over, like the autistic spectrum. You might have someone a little aspergery, and then you have someone who's 30 years old, can't speak, and wears diapers. Okay, so it's like you got someone with narcissistic traits. They're kind of self-centered, but you can live with them. And then on the far end is a a true psychopath. And when we say psychopath, they have no conscience whatsoever. And that's about, depending on who you read, that's about one in 25 people. And most are not psychopathic killers. They're, they're living under the radar or running multinational corporations. A, a great example for right now that people can think about is, and they're often larger than life. You can't take your eyes off them. Um, Elizabeth something who had that company Theranos. Uh, yeah, with a yeah. little blood sample. Um, 
what was that called? Inventor out for blood in Is Silicon it Valley. Gilbert or no? That no, Elizabeth Gilbert's the one who wrote the seduction thing. By oh. the way, <laughs> it's this. Um, but Elizabeth. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It was she, the the documentary. Um, is called Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Um, Alex Dibney wrote it, wrote the documentary for HBO. So that's a perfect example where this woman drops out of Stanford. Elizabeth Holmes. At a, Holmes drops out of Stanford at age 19 and has this idea with absolutely nothing to back it except her own exuberant confidence and gets Henry Kissinger, and Charles Schultz, the former Secretary of State, to believe in her, and she gets funding in the billions to do this thing that never had the backing, but her, okay, this is important. Their belief in themselves, or in their illusion, because they've created a false self, is so huge that if you or I had that belief in our, we wouldn't have that belief in ourselves because for an empathic normal person, we always know there's room for doubt and maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. With them, it's this is the way it's going to be. And they're so charismatic and so convincing. I mean, when she did her very first um, article, I think for the Wall Street Journal, she hired a professional photographer because it's always about how it looks. The image is amazing. Always. I mean, it looks so good. So what I say to people now is, if it seems too good to be true, it is. <laughs> I mean, we've, it usually, we've heard that advice lots of times. It, yeah, but okay, so it's, let's be clear, it's one in five people have one of these things. And most are not Elizabeth Holmes. Most are not Harvey Weinstein. Most are not Bill Cosby. Yeah. They are regular people like your mother who is self-centered, and I heard of one, uh, her mother's 80, and to this day, she keeps saying to each of the children, you're my favorite, and then she plays them against the others until it makes everyone crazy. What is she doing? She's setting herself up as special, and her attention to them splits the rest of the family. It's divide and conquer is the way they work. And then she gets all the attention because you spend your whole life, if you're an empathic person, if you're a healer person, you spend your whole life trying to measure up to what you think they wanted. Because if you have one as a parent, okay, you have kids, you know, yeah, that with two kids, girls. You, you, yeah, so you say to the, to the girls, um, I love you unconditionally. This behavior sucks, but you're fine. No matter what you do, you're fine. With a narcissist as a parent, your job is to constantly make them feel good about themselves. And if you're not measuring up to what they need 24-7, you feel like, you, like something's wrong with you. So empathic people tend to have inferior egos. We feed our egos by trying to improve ourselves. We take self-help courses. We become personal coaches. We hire a trainer. Um, uh, a borderline personality or narcissist is born with a superior ego. They feel that they're better than everyone else, but they have this thing. They're very intuitive, and they have this, um, I call it malignant intuition. They know what you've always wanted to hear. And as long as you feel inferior in some way, as long as they can get that hook in and make you angry or make you whatever, they have power and control. Now, let's say you're married to one. One of my friends was married to one, a woman, and he said every night he'd come home for dinner and he tried to figure out how he was going to lead the dinner table conversation or share his day or whatever in a way that wouldn't make her angry or wouldn't reject him. And that's what we do. We think we can handle these people. But Sandra Brown, who wrote Women Who Love Psychopaths, has a great phrase for this. They are sicker than we are smart. You keep thinking there won't be any landmines around them. But there are always landmines because you can't even think the way they think. It wouldn't ever occur to you to get the upper hand in the way they do. And they are charming. I have a friend who's a 
clinical psychologist. He's worked with um, priests in a diocese, and he started his career as a psychologist by helping men who'd been abused by priests. Hmm. And then the priest, the diocese, was so impressed with his work that they hired him. And he said to me, after 35 years, I'm a very good psychologist, I'm very intuitive, but I know that I can be taken in by a really good narcissist if he or she is charming enough or good looking enough. And so I think that first thing we have to do is let ourselves off the hook if we have one of these people. Um, I had a patient once who had breast cancer and um, she got a reading with Carolyn Mace, the, the renowned medical intuitive, and, Car and she had just finished all of her treatments and she was given a clean bill of health. And Carolyn said to her, you still have cancer viruses going in and out of physical reality. Are you, do you love your husband? Because if you love him, if you really love him, you can stay and it will not affect you physically. But if there's any doubt there, your health is going to suffer if you don't leave. I saw her a year later and she had a new primary totally different cell type, new primary in the other breast. New type she of had, cancer, yeah. A different type of cancer. She hadn't left, um, even though she had a man who was in love with her waiting for her to leave. And I said, what, what is it about why have you stayed? And she said, my fear of abandonment was so strong that I actually preferred to die first so that I wouldn't be abandoned. Hmm. Like if I die first, then I won't be abandoned. And this is why doctors don't talk about it. Isn't it so much easier to just say, well, the clinical trial shows that if we use this adromycin and methotrexate or, or for that matter, if we drink green juice and we meditate, you'll be fine. But what I found in working with individuals in relationship with energy vampires is these were the people who would come to me with chronic Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, kind of terminal PMS, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, autoimmune disorders. And no matter what they did, and believe me, these people did everything they're supposed to do, no matter what they did, it wouldn't work until they finally got out of the relationship. And that's very hard. That's so hard. And I have counseled, lost count of how many cancer patients I've talked to and counseled. And I hear the same things and I see the same things over and over again, right? It's like, it's the same story almost every time. And I've, um, again, lost count of how many patients I talked to who were in, were in a very unhealthy, uh, toxic, dysfunctional marriage, um, and they felt very trapped because, you know, they had no spousal support or the spouse was extreme, extremely demanding and manipulative, yeah. and and it, it's, it is, it's heartbreaking because, and it, even there have even been cases where they, you know, they would maybe go to a clinic alone. And yes. do really well. Yes. Right? Three weeks in Mexico, wherever. Yeah. Yeah. And do really well. They, they feel better. Their energy's coming back. Their blood work's improving. Tumors are shrinking. Like things, great things are happening, you know? Yeah. Yep. And, um, but then they go back home to this like toxic life and, uh, and then things start going the wrong way. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. It's, uh, if you can, there's a, a quote that I've used a lot, um, from Lewis Thomas, who was a former head of uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and he wrote a book called Lives of the Cells. Here's the quote. I have come to see that cancer is the physical metaphor for the extreme need to grow. Wow. I know, right? It's yeah. like, wow. Well, now, here's why doctors don't want to go there. Because we equate it with 
blaming the victim, you see. And there's no power in that stance. None, none. So here's what we would want to do. Um, and I've been reading uh, Dr. Terry Trent's book, The Awakened Woman, and her story is at the age of 14, uh, she got married in Zimbabwe for the price of a cow. That was the bride price. Had four kids by the age of 18. Uh, was terribly abused in her marriage. And long story, Joe Luck from the Heifer Project comes to her village and she desperately wants an education, like a high school diploma, and has a dream of getting a PhD in the United States. And she, because some one person, in this case, Joe Luck, says, if you have a dream, you have the capacity to uh, manifest that dream. And that is a huge piece of information for somebody. So what Tara I did is she wrote down her dreams. I want to get a um, high school diploma, a master's and a PhD. And then because no dream, it has much power unless it uplifts the whole community. That's just, you know, it's like a narcissist dream is I want a really good looking girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, I want to seduce as many people as possible. I want to have all the accolades, the New York Times bestseller. I want to, you know, what they want is me, me, me. You know, that's enough about me. What do you think about me? But Terrorize Dream was much bigger. She buries it in the earth in a can. She buries the dream. And then she goes over and she says, the earth grows things. And then she just watered it with her dreams and with her meditation. And, uh, you know, eventually came to the United States and got a PhD and she's back in Zimbabwe uh, teaching women and girls like, you know, has a school. It's an astounding story. But here's what she says. She says, yes, it's important to pay attention to the statistics. OK, it's one in five people. Um, it, usually they're not going to give you child support and all of that. You said you have to know the facts, but don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck there because we each have far greater power, like the universe working through us or God working through us. Have you had in, in your counseling with people, can you think of some of the people who got out and, and what they did and how they managed to um, create a new life? Because that's what we're really talking about. It, it's, I love what you say. You say to people on the first meeting, I thought it was like so right on, well, it's clear your lifestyle's killing you. I mean, it, 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 I think that that's kind of, that's the kind of electroshock therapy that people need. Yeah, the way you're living is killing you. That's it. That's it. The way you're living is killing you. The people you're living with could be killing you. Yeah, You know. right. And so I think the first step, what you and I are doing now, we're laying out the problem. We're, we're laying out the issue. I mean, I was in psychiatry uh, as a med student. I went to all these meetings. I would see when there was one borderline personality disorder on the unit, on the psych ward, the nurses would all start fighting with each other. That's what they do. They garner favor and then they, you know, let's you and her fight. And then they, they come out scot-free. It's unbelievable. Um, Remember Kyle Cease? We met Kyle. Oh, yes. At, uh, you know, love Kyle. And uh, one of my friends recently went to his workshop at Omega. And there was a woman in the workshop, clearly a borderline, who says to him, would you like to work out your problem here in the group? Like, first of all, he's the authority. He's the group leader. That is completely inappropriate. And, you know, th there was nothing he could do to stop this woman from disrupting the group. Luckily, she didn't come back the next day because she didn't get the narcissistic supply she was looking for. And I would like to point out to people, if you watch The Color Purple, it's a good renter. There's, um, you know, there's that scene where the guy who's been abusing Celie for years and keeping her sister's letters from her and all of that, she finally finds love. Someone loves her. And in that moment, she gets the fuel that gets people out of one of these situations. And the fuel is righteous anger, righteous anger. 
she looks across the table. Danny Glover was playing the role. And she goes, you touch me again and your life will rot. I used to want to have that on repeat in the waiting room of my of my center. This was like years before I understood the dynamics. So we've talked about the energy vampire. Now let's talk about the people who are targeted. Okay, that's the main thing because uh, there are those who see these people for what they are. Like let's say that um, a guy comes on to you in a bar and he gives you a sob story. Oh, my wife left me, I can't see the kids, blah, blah, blah. Okay, if you're a certain kind of person, you're going to believe him. Oh, my God, I can help him. I'm pretty sure that I can help him. But then you've got the person with the good radar, and they go, what a loser. I mean, you know, I I don't think I want to date him. But if you are a particular type, and Sandra Brown has done research on this, it's a personality type that she says has super traits, super traits of loyalty, conscientiousness, empathy, a can-do attitude. This kind of super trait, she said, is as innate as your eye color. You're born that way. You do not see the red flags. And these energy vampires know it. So what I say to people is you haven't been chosen You've been targeted because they target you. Oh, yeah, I'm, ooh, I can see that. She'll pay for this. Is, this is the, the kind of story, you know, lifetime television for women. When they talk about the, uh, the, the guy, the sociopath who comes in and preys on midlife women and they pay for everything and they take him all over the world and then he just disappears. There is a great show currently on Masterpiece Theater on PBS called Mrs. Wilson. It's a true story of a woman during World War II who meets a guy, falls in love with him. It's, the, it's wartime, and he works for the Secret Service and this and that, and, and she marries him. And uh, then she later finds out he dies. In the opening scene, he dies. And then a guy comes to the door who's his son from another marriage. And it, it's well worth watching because this is a master sociopath. She never, ever even knew. She never knew. And she kept believing, but he loves me because that's how good they are at making you think that they actually love you. They're, they're like masters of manipulation and they pray on a certain kind of person. Now, yeah, and when you, they give you attention too, you feel like you feel like you know you're the the most important special person in the world. You got when, thank when you. They're shining it, attention on you, right? Yeah, and and because and their eyes. Okay, so the really skilled narcissists, like the good-looking, really skilled ones, when they train their eyes on you, when they start telling you how amazing you are when they write you poetry or whatever, you really <laughs> think, you really think, oh my God, um, because there is a kind of an irresistible addictive quality to them. But when you begin to withdraw, you will see someone become so full of rage, so angry, or, or just a deflated balloon. Uh, like when your attention is no longer on them, when you see it for what it is, they become very, very small. They literally just sort of disappear because they're they're a blown up balloon. They're, they don't source themselves from inside. And you can begin to see this. And once you understand your super traits, you know, at, at this point, because I have those, and th those super traits work beautifully when you're writing books, when you have a career. I mean, they work every other place except with this type of character. And so one of my male friends says, why do so many accomplished, wonderful women end up with guys like this? Well, that's why. Well, first of all, we got a, we got a narrative in patriarchy for decades where women didn't even have the right to vote until, what is it, 1930. And you weren't allowed to have money uh, up until like the turn of the century, 1900. 
And so therefore, when a man gives you attention, but you also want to be a doctor, a lawyer, run a company, you've been told it's kind of in the water. Like no man is going to love someone who's that accomplished. Now that's changing. That's changing dramatically. My daughter's married to a guy who does half the child care, half the everything. They both work together. I'm seeing this more and more. But in general, that narrative has been the way, the way of it. And it makes women with super traits have the belief that if I'm not with this guy, I'll be alone because I'm so accomplished over here that no one's going to love me. And I'd rather be with this guy than be alone. And, and I have news for everybody. <laughs> You're never alone. You're actually with yourself. You're with yourself. And it is a step that I would say for everybody, not just cancer patients, for everybody I'd love you all to go through the process of coming home to yourself and liking your own company because we can all get there. We can all get there. We have that capacity. And if you really don't like yourself, then you, then you have a, an increased need to have someone with you at all times, right? Which is yeah. pro probably best described as... Um, uh, oh, I'm, 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 I'm forgetting the terminology now, but, but I, you know, I used to not like myself, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. really, I mean, before I got cancer, you know, for years I was very insecure. I was very critical, very judgmental, um, just unhappy, you know, on the yeah. inside. And, yeah. um, and it, it affected me in lots of ways. And I, I basically overcompensated with, you know, trying to be successful. I was a musician. I was on stage, like showing off. You know, it's like I was doing all these things to overcompensate for how insecure and unhappy I was with me, you know. And so. Yeah. Um, and did you. OK, so you were a musician and you were on stage. So talk about that for a minute, because. I remember Steven Tyler of Aerosmith saying, my family is the front row. Um, there is this incredible amount of energy that comes at you from a performance, from being on stage. It's an in and so how did you overcome that so that, you know, because it's a cautionary tale, right? All the rock stars who yeah. uh, have killed themselves and because they needed that attention so badly. But I mean, let's look at Elvis. Um, what a what an example right down there in your own hometown. That's right, just a few I miles mean, that, away. That man was the son. I mean, let's talk charisma, astounding charisma. I mean, I think that his estate is making more money now than he ever did when he was and when I hear one of his songs, even now, the, the voice, the whole thing was unbelievable, but somehow he never managed the, the thing that you did, which turned the cancer off, I think. Gosh, I, you know, you, I've thought about this um, a lot. And w what happened with me was I got the cancer diagnosis I went on the holistic path after surgery, which was, you know, stepping back and saying, okay, the way I'm living is killing me. I'm just going to accept that. That's going to be sort of the premise for, for you know, <laughs> right. Right? right? It might not have been everything I was doing, but I think it's healthier to just go ahead and blame yourself for everything and then you can get, go start moving forward. Or well, I would say, okay, I take responsibility for everything. Yes. So you're like responsible to it, not for it. Exactly. You, and I know it's they're right, interchangeable yeah. terms, but yeah, the reality is like But I'm look, with you. That you gotta start there. It's because there's no power anywhere else. Yeah. So okay. maybe it's your fault, maybe it's not your fault, but the reality is you gotta take responsibility for it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so I had that empowering belief, right? That like, okay, maybe it's my fault. And if it is, this is actually good news for me because I can change my life and maybe I can contribute to my health and healing yeah. and recovery. So that's where it started and like in the process of investigation, of trying to understand like what is causing disease in my life 
Yeah. And it wasn't just one thing, right? It wasn't like, oh, it was that uh, that uh, piece of bacon you ate six years ago. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? It was like, my diet's terrible. My lifestyle's not healthy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm like learning and learning and learning and reading. And then, I'm, then I come across the, the stress and emotional component of health. And, I, you know, I was just challenged by multiple influencers and authors and healers to look inward and I had this you know sort of like epiphany I guess you could say that the way I'm living is killing me and also you know I I really don't like myself and if I don't like myself what I'm doing is I'm sending signals to my body to decay yeah you know what I mean yeah it's like signals yeah. of decay and corruption in my body and like this you know cancer is like mutiny Right, it's like your cells are are, commit, are committing mutiny, and they're like, "We don't like the way you're running the ship, right? Like we're <laughs> gonna take over." But they're, you know, obviously really bad at it, yeah. and they wreck the whole thing. Right. So that was, you know, th- those are the kind of ideas that were sort of populating in my in my head, and then, and, you know, I just started. I, I was just like, okay, well, all right, I've got to start thinking differently. I've got to start loving myself. I've got to. I've got to just accept and love and be thankful for who I am. And see, I think a lot of my attitudes were rooted in selfishness, okay? In uh-huh. narcissism, in selfishness, in, um, and obviously not extreme, but enough of it, I would just say, look, I'm spoiled, right? I'm just a spoiled American white guy. <laughs> Okay, and I, I, and I, I, you know, I'm maybe a little better looking than the average guy. I'm maybe a little more talented than some people or whatever, but like things that always come pretty easy to me. And so I'd never really practiced gratitude. Yeah, I'd never understood it. And then when everything got taken away, so metaphorically, when with the cancer diagnosis, all the stuff that I cared about evaporated. And it was just me and my wife. And a, a life-threatening disease. You know, this is this yeah. is my life. And then three months in, she gets pregnant. Now we've got a baby on the way. But that was intentional. <laughs> that was intentional. Like, we actually wanted to get pregnant. But point is, like, so all that's happening, and I'm like, okay, I have to start thinking differently. I've got to start loving my body. Because if I don't like my body, if I hate my body, like, I don't think it's going to heal. And so that, I don't know, that, that was, those were the, the thoughts and attitudes and, and perspective that, that, I, that I started to, to started to gel. And then I was just working them out, you know, practicing gratitude and just saying, oh my gosh, like, I've got to learn how to be happy. Like, I've got a lot to be unhappy about right yeah, now. Yeah, but I got to be, learn to be happy now. Yes. Before the cancer is gone. Right. I have to learn to be happy now. I can't defer my happy. And this is what so many people do, right? I can't defer my happiness into the future, right? I can't say I'll be happy when I get this car or this house or have this much money or this much success or fame or fortune or whatever. Uh, I, I've got to be happy now. And I learned how. And the, the secret really for me was gratitude, right? I just realized like, you know what? I have a choice every day. I can focus on all the bad things in my life. I can focus on the negative things, cancer being the biggest, or I can focus on all the good things I have and I can count my blessings. So let's do that. What do I have that's good? Well, I can get out of bed. I'm not dying in the hospital, right? Every day I wake up in my home, in my bed, is a great freaking day, right? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Every day I'm not dying in the hospital is a great day. So it's like I started there and then I'm like, I can, I can see, I can hear, like I can take care of myself. I have a wife who loves me. I have a baby on the way. I have a home. I have enough money to to pay the next set of bills when they come in. And so like, I just start sort of tabulating all the good stuff. And I, and I, I just, I just quickly learned that, wow, the gratitude just welled up. Every time I would do that, I would just stop myself right in the middle of thinking. And that, that, that's the secret, too, is like right in the middle of the negative emotion taking over, right? Right in the middle of the yeah. frustration, the anger, the fear, 
like whatever, I would catch myself and just say, God, I trust you. I'm giving you my fear. It's all yours, right? I trust you. And thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that I have my life and my health. Thank you for my wife. Thank you that I, I have a car, you know, and just boom. Like, I right. mean, it's, it's almost instantaneous how quickly my, my emotions and attitude and everything would change. So that was a discipline. Like every day I was catching myself and retraining my brain. That is fantastic. Now, if, but you did not, as far as I know, you were not living with any energy vampires, right? No, no. My wife was not an energy vampire. No, no. And you guys and it, are still... Yeah, we're still together, still married. Yeah, I, yeah. And I didn't have any, um, yeah, didn't have that, that problem. So here is the thing that a super trait person will do. And this is important. This is uh, like really crucial. We can make excuses for somebody's behavior for 200 years. We have that ability to see the good in other people. Uh, you know, he's a good man. He doesn't beat me. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. therefore, you need if, if you are somebody, and I know there are people listening who are going to relate to this. If you have an energy vampire, and no matter what you do, you, you just know it, you need to manage your super traits, you need to find a support system, and that can be one person who gets it. Uh, one of my friends who was, you know, very, very uh, religious and really was into sort of self-sacrifice, uh, you know, almost the self-flagellation order of nuns. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. And um, so she would call me with some of the things that her husband had done. And she'd say, I'm feeling, you know, so exhausted. And he just did this, that and the other thing. And is that OK? And and her level of um when you live with this for so long and you get so beaten down, you don't even see how bad it is. Your body does. That's why the cancer or the chronic fatigue or, or the chronic Lyme or whatever it is, your body does. But your intellect, you have the ability to see the best. Now, that is a wonderful trait. It is a wonderful trait that will kill you in relationship to an energy vampire. I have a friend who was beaten by her husband. She came from Liverpool. She was in Canada at the time. She ended up in the hospital. Her mother flew over from Liverpool and she said, took pictures of her and said, now, I want you to write down everything that happened in a journal. Write it down now so that you have it. And before you go back to this man, read it, read it. And if you go back to this man, that is your choice. But you need to get real about what's going on in the moment. This is called, by the way, cognitive dissonance. It's interesting that in Sandra Brown's workshops, in her retreats, 70 to 80 percent of the women have autoimmune diseases. They have sarcoidosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, all of that autoimmune diseases where their immune system is trying so hard and it doesn't know what to do because they're giving themselves away for someone else. And what happens is, here's cognitive dissonance. The difference between what you say you believe and what's really happening, it creates executive function disorder in the brain so that you really aren't, you don't think clearly. You, you literally lose your ability to think clearly because you have the belief all people are good and this person is um, berating you, hitting you, taking your money, whatever it is, criticizing you. So those two things are quite different and you keep trying in your mind to make it okay when it's not okay. So you need to have somebody that is a reality check person. And then of course, right now on the internet, there's endless, endless resources um, for uncovering narcissism. When I went through my divorce, I didn't. Here's a good one. Work. Yeah, that's a really good one. Dodging energy vampires and my dodging energy vampire online course, 
where I interview some of the experts like George Simon, who wrote In Sheep's Clothing, and Sandra Brown, and it's step by step by step by step what you need to do. Yeah. And it's not codependence, by the way. This is what, what Sandra point, pointed out. All these women would show up at the codependent meetings, the 12-step meetings. It's not really codependence. They're, these are doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, CEOs. These are not people who are weak-willed or don't have much going on. It's really different. Yeah. That, that's the term I, got, I, I could not grab yeah. a hold of earlier, but codependence yeah, yeah. is... You know, the person who's so unhappy with with themselves, they don't like themselves so much that they always have to be surrounded by, right. or at least with someone, like they go from right. relationship to relationship, like they just can't ever be alone. Right, right, exactly. So it, it, it's not that. So, yeah, I would, I really think, frankly, everyone in the helping professions need to read this book because they will see, oh my God, that's me. I was even revising the other day The Wisdom of Menopause, and I am reading what I had written about my marriage, and I see that my blinders were still on in the first edition of that book. Because, you know, there was a time when, uh, after he had left, you know, he sent me flowers, you know, um, thank you for our daughters, and our, you know, and then I start to cry, you know, oh my God, he still, he really did love me. The answer is no. Or, or maybe, you know, to the extent that he was capable, possibly, but me breaking down and thinking, oh, God, you know, what, because you, you keep doing a check. What could I have done differently? Um, you know, I really believe that I had ruined my own marriage by uh, becoming successful somehow. I mean, when he started to be called Mr. Northrop, that was kind of the end. And <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Dr. Christian Northrup, I presume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had changed my name to his, but I just, here's what I did. Now with this wouldn't, I don't think this would happen anymore because we're too far ahead in history. I hope, but I would, you know, I loved my work, but I loved being married. And I would think, well, I'll just do this little work in women's health over here and nobody will notice. And then over here, I'll be the little woman and the perfect mother. And, I don't want this to ever encroach. And it all ended. It was the, the sort of the big incision and drainage was the first time I was on Oprah. Mm. And yeah, that was the end. That was the end. You know, How? I had, Why? Well, because I had the whole world calling my home office to tell me, how wonderful it was, and you know, the, isn't this fantastic? And I'm on with my first book, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. And that's in my home office, so it's in a different part of the house. But meanwhile, Back in the room where you watch the television, nobody was happy. I, you know, the person who was supposed to make dinner didn't because she was pissed that she wasn't in the B-roll. Um, my husband kept wanting me to check little, you know, pimple in his ear. Nobody's saying anything great except one daughter. And I realized, wait a minute. I have this whole thing in the outer world that's working for me. And I've created, and I knew it, by the way, this is that take responsibility and I've created in my home uh, a non-safe environment that does not value me. And why did I do it? Because there's a part of me that felt that if I didn't make myself smaller at home, then I would be alone. I would be nobody would be willing to be with me. So let's keep this career thing. On, on wraps and let's let's just go transform women's health in our spare time okay and in the meantime make sure everything's done at home I mean that's completely ridiculous it comes from a, a belief system of as you said that you're not enough that you're not enough and that you somehow have to make excuses for your life and you know and I also say in um in the wisdom of menopause that, you know, I married aspects of my mother. We do that. It's to bring love where it hasn't been before. And I think that what help, what helps is not to think we blew it or we made a mistake, but instead say, this was the curriculum and I aced the test. I saw it. I experienced it. I saw it. I got out. Yeah. Yeah. It 
it's, I know there's a fine line between taking responsibility, right? And, and without, you know, like I say, like blaming yourself, but without beating yourself up. Without, without beating yourself up, Without yeah. blame and shame. Yeah. And just saying, okay, like, let's just take a, a cold and sober assessment of my situation, right? Like, Yes, right? yes. Like, and the, you mentioned cognitive dissonance, right? So I believed these things... I, you know, I read a quote the other day, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's it, it, it's great, and it it was basically like this person. I'm not even know who said it, you know, but basically it was like always be willing to to entertain the idea that you may be completely wrong. Yes. Right. So yeah. So it's like uh, so there's that moment where you're like, what? Okay, what if I'm wrong? Right. <laughs> I could be wrong. Like I'm in a mess, and so now like. There, there have got to be steps to to get out of this mess. And what part do I need to play in this? What do I need to do? And what do I need to change? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so you can start, if you're in relationship with one of these people, you can begin to make notes, like write down what's actually going on. Another way to do it is there are these apps like the family, um, you know, the family scheduling apps? Because what you find is these it, these characters will almost always they it, it's called gaslighting. Yes, gaslighting comes from the movie Gaslight, where this guy was trying to make his wife think she was crazy, and he turned down the gaslight, and then deny that it had just flickered and almost gone off. And then he'd turn it on again. And she'd say, what? but the light just went off. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. So you begin to doubt your own sanity. So therefore, um, as I uh, heard from somebody who teaches this, if you have one of those apps where you have a schedule and, every, and it can't be changed, this works well in the court system, apparently. The schedule can't be changed. So you see that this person keeps changing. That's a shell game. They keep changing what they said. And increasingly, these people, let's be clear, they have owned the court system. They have owned it. Uh, you go in there and you think you're crazy because they're so charming. But that's starting to change as people understand what's going on. I'm finding more and more people understand this. They didn't in the 80s at all. A little better in the 90s. Now, uh, I believe we're, we're on to it, uh, particularly after the Me Too movement. And mm -hmm. by the way, I think that there's got to be, there's a Me Too movement for men. I see as many men, good men, who have been in relationship with borderline women that you can't do right by. You can't, no matter what you do, it's not enough for her. Um, this is the woman who is in it for, we call it the boat, the house, and the car. She never really loves you. She's just there because she sees that you're the kind of guy who will kill yourself trying to give her the material goods that she wants. I've seen it. You've seen it. And these men are left, these good men, they're left like a, um, a hulk by the side of the road that someone has sucked the living life out of. Yeah. So it's, I want to be clear that, you know, my, my work has been in women's health, but there's many, many, many female vampires, many. Well, thank you for <laughs> taking up for us guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You good ones. You well, good guys. <laughs> I, and I, I want to talk a little bit about victimhood, too, because, uh, you, you know, one of the problems with the cancer industry and uh, is that most cancer patients are basically made into powerless victims. Right? Oh, they're yes. a victim of disease, right? Yes. Nothing you did yes. contributed. It's not your fault. It's just bad luck. Maybe it's genetic. And well, let's we'll just give you a hug and a pat on the back and a little little tear for you. And you just make sure you show up for treatment, and we'll do the best we can. Well, let me tell you what I think. The biggest pink washing of the world is that run for the cure. Like anyone ever got cured by running. Um, that pink washing and the pink ribbon and the NFL and the pink outfits, this is so disempowering. It's so bad. We don't give men with prostate cancer little Tonka trucks, do we? No, that would be like ridiculous. So give the guy a teddy bear. No. 
I know. <laughs> oh, I. I yeah, well, so you're right. Remember the the orange is the new black was some popular show, and I think in there the woman says, "Tell them you have cancer; they'll leave you alone." Mm. Right, and so we. How about? I hope we can we can do this again because there's so much more we can talk about, and we're almost out of time. <laughs> but because right. um, I, oh, you're so amazing. Um, but the thing about victimhood that I wanted to get to is that. Uh, but in some cases, we are victimized. We are. Like, we are, and especially absolutely. with the emotional vampire situation. Like, you are victimized. Yeah. You're absolutely. You are targeted. So, your power comes with understanding how bad it is. And then, now, this is the key you reach down into the heart of the wounded little child within you and you comfort him or her. Because it's generally the wounded child inside who is running your endocrine system, your central nervous system, your immune system. And you've got to grow that part of yourself up. And you do it through love, through acceptance, but not letting the child run those systems anymore. Yeah. Yeah, And speaking, you know, I know it sounds weird to some people watching or listening, but I found it to be so powerful for me to actually speak to myself. Yes. Right? Yes. Like what you're talking about, encouraging myself. No one will encourage you more than you. No, and besides, when you talk to yourself, every cell hears that. <laughs> you yeah, know, they, every they, cell they hears resonate. it. <laughs> they resonate with your voice. Yeah, and so it's like, it, you know, you're okay, you're safe, you are loved, like be be well, yeah. be healthy, heal, and and so just like speaking life and health to your body, to your cells, uh, it, it's I talk about this in my course in my book. I mean, you know, I know you talk about these things too, but uh, it's I know it's weird. I, I get it. Some people are like it yeah. seems weird. I've never done that before, but you know, it try it. That's that's my <laughs> give it a try. Yeah, you know. Bernie Siegel, who wrote Love, Medicine, and Miracles, and Bernie and I were co-presidents of the American Holistic Medical Association, and he used to say, give yourself a live message. Give yourself a live message. He also said something else that I loved. In his audiences, which were huge at the time, he would say, how many of you want to live to be 100? And they'd raise their hand. Then he'd ask them the other question. If you had some fabulous day all set up for yourself, and then your mother or your son or your neighbor called you and said they needed help moving, how many of you would cancel that wonderful day for yourself and go and help with the moving? And then, of course, the hands would go up because they all thought, you know, they were being holy. And he would say, you're the ones who are more likely to get cancer. <laughs> Whoa, right? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because because there's this cancer personality type, right? That and they're not like there's just one, but there's one that's pretty predominant. I feel like, and yeah. that's what we're talking about. What you're alluding to right now is that person that's always putting others the others' needs in front of theirs. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And can you expound on that too? That personality more? Yeah, it's it's deselfing yourself. It's putting yourself last. It's the burnt toast syndrome. You all take the burnt toast. Everybody else have everything else. And there's a reason for it. So let me give you the positive reason for it. If you are um, a nurturer, healer type, it gives you pleasure to help someone else. It literally, there's this kind of um, rescue addiction. Mm. I would feel it myself when I was in the hospital days when I'd have Three women in labor, two needed an emergency C-section. The emergency room would call me. You would get on this adrenaline high where you had a need to be needed, and you'd go down to the emergency room. Honest to God, I'd feel like um, Florence Nightingale, lady with the lamp, you know, like I'm coming in and I'm the big hero of the moment. You get enormous positive feedback. But at the end of the day, they're not going to be there for you when you need it. So you got to ask yourself, who could I call if I really need? And, and here's the other thing. Would you ever, would you ever want your best friend to not go 
and have her um, concert tickets or her birthday dinner or her house tour, would you actually ask someone to come and help you move and have them sacrifice that? Never. That'd be the you couldn't live with yourself. So we have to look at that, I think, as rescue addiction. <laughs> what you just described, that's amazing. That's so profound. And what you just described is exactly the same feeling as, you know, full circle here, as me being on stage. Ah, performing, there it is. Right? Yes. yes. It's the hero. Yeah. Right? Like, when it's guitar hero, right? You're on stage. People are, like, you know, cheering and applauding you and their attention's on you and like you feel amazing and validated and important and needed and loved. Like, you know, it's just like this, it's, it is extremely addictive in, in all the same ways. But yes, the, those people there at the, you know, half drunk or completely drunk people at the bar, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> watching your show, they're not going to be there for you. I mean, there's a few loved ones out there, but uh, usually, yeah. uh, if there aren't, you're really doing something wrong. But, okay. uh, but yeah, they're not going to be there for you. You know, no. you're there to entertain them, and and that's all. But um, and I, obviously, I'm still on stage. I'm on bigger stages now than I've ever been. Which is okay. Isn't that but the great paradox? Yeah. By turning it over, really, to that divine part of yourself, to bringing much more of your soul into your body, you now you're doing the thing that Tara I Trent talked about before. It was for your ego gratification. Yes. Now it uplifts the whole community. Yeah. It's a totally Real. different feeling. Um, and it, all of that prepped me. Like every all the, all the stuff in my life prepared me for what I'm doing now. As you know, that's how life is. But, but yeah, the feeling and the reason I speak now is totally different. I don't even... I, yeah, it's, it's not a production. It's not a show. It's not an act. You know, it's, it's, I'm there to serve. It's not a sales pitch. Like I'm no. not, I'm not there to sell. I'm, I'm here to serve and That's inspire right. and encourage and empower and, and just like be with the people who showed up for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, it, that's the best feeling ever. And in a, in a healthy yeah, way. It's, it's true. There's, there's no burnout with that. Yeah. There's and no I don't have burnout. an addiction to it. Right. I mean, really, I don't, I mean, I love to do it, but I don't feel like there, I don't have this like, oh, I need to speak. I need to speak. I'm, you know, because I made a decision like I don't want to be away from my family. So I, my priorities to me, I believe, are very healthy in in that like I've kind of played the tape all the way forward and realized like I don't want my kids to grow up and look back and say, oh, our dad. Yeah, he was famous or whatever he was. And, you know, he was never home. Yeah, he was always gone. He was always speaking. He was always off doing stuff like that's not the memory I want them to have of me. So as much as I love to speak, I don't do it that often because I'd rather be at home eating dinner with the family and doing the dishes after my wife makes dinner. Exactly. You know, I, um, years ago I started turning down, I turned down 90% of the invitations to speak or go somewhere because I created a life that I like, Yeah. that I really like. Right. Don't have to yeah. escape it. I don't need to escape it by anything. No. <laughs> that's, so. that's perfect. That's yeah. great. And, and, you know, hopefully for me, it, you know, maybe when my kids are grown, I'll speak a lot more. Well, yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, but like this season of my life, there's a few, speak a few times a year. And I love it so much. And, you know, I wish I could do it, you know, a few times a week. But at the end of the day, there's sacrifices like I'm not willing to make. Exactly. Exactly. And obviously, your cells are happy about all that. I'm trying to keep them happy. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, Dr. Northrup, thank you for your time. Oh, my gosh. This has been so fun. I, I hope we can do it again soon and talk about more. I mean, you're just such a deep well of wisdom and expertise and just knowledge. <laughs> and been out this for a long time. We've got a lot of depth here. All right. Depth thank is you. good. Thank well, you, Chris. Thank you so Great. much. Everybody, thanks for watching. Please share this video. Obviously, if you've made it to the end, you know how uh, powerful this information is, especially related to 
energy vampires. I mean, there may be people in your life that are sucking the life out of you. And if you have cancer, this is super critical to address head on. I, I want to encourage you all to read, oops, I picked up two things at once, but to read Dr. Northrop's book, Dodging Energy Vampires. And I know there's resources in there and she's got a course and more things that can help you uh, if this is a, a clear and present danger in your life. Uh, but even on the prevention side, you know, if you if you see a threat in your life, uh, it's better to, to take some action now and try to remove these cancer causers before, you know, before you're in a crisis. So anyway, that's a long pitch for me to say, please share this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And thanks right. again, Dr. Northrup. Bye, everybody. Thank you.